Nationwide, people are calling for police reform and change in use of force tactics in the wake of George Floyd's death at the hands of police. The imminent threat that black men face on a daily basis, and right now, too often, it is law enforcement. We understand that the people aren't just hungry, they're hungry for justice. In the last few weeks, chokeholds have been banned in Minneapolis, the state of New York, and across the country. California is also moving to ban such neck restraints. And Congress has been debating legislation that would encourage bans on chokeholds, limit qualified immunity for officers, and create a national database of police misconduct. But so far, they failed to agree on anything. We don't spend a lot of time holding police officers accountable for their misdeeds. And if we were to do that, then we would have fewer protests, but more importantly, we would have fewer unarmed people killed, particularly unarmed people of color. So how could policing change in this country? And will Congress be able to agree on effective reform? The police do two things really well. They detain and they use force. They spend way more time training on that than they do anything else. Dr. Lorenzo Boyd spent 14 years as a sheriff's deputy. He says his experience in law enforcement has helped frame his research on police issues. Many police departments have roughly 900 hours of training. And of that 900 hours, between 80 and 100 hours is training with the firearm. Eight hours is de-escalation training. That's for Connecticut. Most states don't require de-escalation training at all. When you train the police with this level of machismo, or this macho version of policing, that we're the warriors, we must win, it's us versus them, that's problematic. Part of that training has historically included neck restraints. The legislation currently being debated in Congress attempts to change that by prohibiting federal funding to police departments that use chokeholds. But Boyd says it wouldn't make enough of a difference. Does that mean we can't do chokeholds in policing anymore? No, because if you've determined that deadly force is warranted, you can use a chokehold. I want to emphasize, just because they banned it, that doesn't mean it can't be used if the situation calls for some type of carotid restraint. And in some ways, it's kind of a dog whistle. It's allowing policing, bad policing, to continue unchecked. Both Boyd and Obayashi are right. Police are given wide discretion in deciding what force is appropriate in any situation. This is because of a concept called qualified immunity. There's no law anywhere that says officers cannot use this type of force under any circumstances. If it's a split second situation, the law clearly recognizes it. there's no time to think the officer is in the fight for his or her life and needs to do whatever needs to be done in the circumstances. Qualified immunity shields officers from being held personally liable for excessive use of force as long as they haven't violated a clearly established law and they're judged on if they acted as a reasonable officer would in that situation. What that tells us is that elected officials or public servants, particularly police officers, are immune from civil or criminal prosecution while using their discretion, provided that at the time they believe that what they were doing was within the realm of the law and their job. And that's a really low bar. Democrats and Republicans take different stances on qualified immunity. Democrats want to get rid of it altogether. Republicans say it's a non-starter, it's a poison pill, and that the average police officer shouldn't have to be worrying about whether they're going to be taken to court uh, whenever they pull a weapon or uh, you know, approach a situation. Another point of contention between the two political parties involves police militarization. Over the last 20 years or so, we've seen an over-militarization of policing. And we've seen it most recently with peaceful protests. The problem comes when I'm trying to peacefully protest and you show up in ultra-aggressive gear. That makes me now defensive. That makes me on edge. And that's the big concern that Democrats have. You know, if you're giving police officers modified tanks and weapons and body armor that you only normally see on a battlefield, how are they going to approach the public? Democrats want to limit what items can be transferred from the military to local departments. The Republican bill doesn't mention this in any way. I think the bill going through Congress is a good start. 
the problem is it became really watered down. They added caveats, like unless the police can articulate that they feared for their lives. That's a really low bar. Boyd says that the proposed legislation also falls short of effective reform with a national database of police misconduct. While the Democrats want this database to be public, Republicans want it to be available only to law enforcement agencies. And there's only really so much that Congress can do. Anytime Congress tries to place restrictions on how the executive branch gives out money, they kind of run into trouble. And so they can tell the Justice Department that they have to do this, but the Justice Department doesn't really have to follow through. When it comes to that use of force database, yeah, it might not have that much teeth. While Congress is currently at a stalemate for agreeing on a reform bill, lawmakers still see this as a time for action on police reform. These changes will happen, but they should not happen someday. This should be the day. This should be the time so that we can ensure that this nightmare ends in America. Again, we'll see what the final bill ends up looking like and what, if anything, reaches the president's desk and if he'll sign it. This has been going on for generations, dare I say hundreds of years. So changing police culture is like turning a battleship. It's going to be slow, but we can actually make it happen.